All right, welcome everybody to the August 17th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as everybody on this call is aware, two things that we have to abide by. The first is the antitrust policy. The second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. All right, for announcements today, we have the standard Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. Uh, if you would like to include anything in that newsletter, please do leave a comment on um, the upcoming newsletters wiki page that is linked off of the agenda. The second one says meeting management. I'm not sure who added this. That would be me. Okay. So I uh, want to show people on the TOC that are generally in a lot of community meetings. Uh, we now have Zapier set up, plugged into Zoom. And so, for instance, these two meetings, this Aries VCX call and this uh, APAT call for Cacti Maintainers, these are automatically uploaded. Um, there's, I'm working on making every single piece of it completely automatic, but it's much better than it used to be. Um, the names come from the meetings. And I see I have a meeting I need to edit. Um, so these are for the defined meetings. Some of you have calls that are not on defined meetings and we need to fix that. So I will be talking to each of you in turn about getting your meetings on defined calls that are automatically recorded to the cloud so they get to YouTube automatically. Uh, I appreciate your forbearance in working with me and getting this done. Uh, one reason that we're doing this is it costs money to have videos on the wiki and uh, it's a terrible hosting platform. The other reason is we get transcripts that are, when we do a cloud recording, very nice. So I know that there are some meetings where people will stop the cloud recording because for they have reasons. Please don't. Um, the second thing that I wanted to show you is we have the hyperledger.dev website, um, which was basically unused. This is uh, going to become uh, a web page about how to get involved. This is a repo. If there are any edits that you want to make, uh, I ask you to uh, send in a pull request. They are greedily accepted. And if there are no questions on meeting management, then I will hand the baton off. Steven? Um, you say don't stop the recording. Um, it, would it be possible or is it an option to have some meetings set to not auto record and so that it's up to the um, organizer to turn on recording and record to the cloud? I just um, find it painful to have the all of the preliminary stuff recorded so that you have to find where the meeting actually starts. Um, thoughts okay. on that? So I, I do have thoughts on that. Um, one thing, and I'm not sure, let's just grab a random meeting here. Uh, I'm looking for the, uh, so it doesn't, or it does. So it doesn't, It'll automatically record meeting. You can't turn that off. I, I can, but uh, I'd rather not. Um, doesn't look like the host codes are published. Let me get back to you on that. Okay. Because if you have the host code, you can, you know, stop the cloud recording, which we do here for the TOC call. Yeah. And then start it when it starts. And if you oh, pause, I you said, oh, I thought you said not to do that. Oh, is that okay to do? Yeah. But, so, so not. Not stop, but pause, right? What, but pause. No, no. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm looking for one here. Um, so this is a non-credit spec working group. Yeah. Um, I think those are just people that showed up randomly. Um, if you stop the recording and start it, when you go into, uh, I don't have any, uh, I'm looking for one that has a bunch of uh, files. I don't see one they will show up as two separate recordings. So it's really easy to delete the uh, very short recording. 
like okay. this one, which is 220 kilobytes, that's easy to delete. Uh, if you pause it, then you end up with uh, one recording and it, it, it just makes the problem worse. So it's better to stop the cloud recording and then start it. Okay. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. That's that's what I was looking for. Okay. Um, and so just to be clear, the the short recording will still be added to the page. We would go in and edit it if we wanted to after. So uh, what happens and what happened this morning is I woke up and there were, I don't know, uh, five or 10 short recordings here. They're private when they're published. I'm sorry, they're private when they're uploaded. So I just went through here and selected a bunch of uh, uh, junk meetings, deleted the recordings, and then I uh, handled the rest. Putting on the playlist and stuff is not automatic yet, but I'm working on that. Okay. So there will be no intervention on your part required. Sure. That's awesome. Rye, you're amazing. <laughs> That's perfect. So my practice will tend to be the auto is on. I'll stop. I'll claim host, stop the recording, start it when the meeting sta starts, and all will be good. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. And, and when you start it, record to the cloud. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Always record to the cloud. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on that process? No. Any other announcements? Sorry, one more comment. Sorry, I couldn't find mute. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I would suggest, I did a document a while ago about um, hosting um, Hyperledger meetings. Uh, we probably should have a document like that. I have one somewhere in my indie stack because I was turning the the process over to somebody else. And so I just wrote all of my, my notes about how to do that. So things like what we just talked about there should be included in that. So um yep that is top of mind um okay. for the the ca team in our meeting today we're going to cover exactly how we want to communicate this i just wanted to uh get yeah. in touch with toc members first um awesome Bobby. yeah my question i have two questions um so the first one is if we, like i know the um documentation task for sometimes we have random meetings during the week and I just use my Zoom room. Um, should I be setting this up through the public calendar, even though it's like just a, a between me and my mentor or like, should we be primarily using the Zoom room through the Linux foundation or should, you know, for adjunct meetings, use our own? Are these meetings, um, you said you and your mentor are, I mean, are these meetings that you want to end up on YouTube? Not necessarily. If they aren't, then don't worry about it. If they are, then let's talk about it. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then the other thing was just offering the services of the documentation um, user group. We're using a lot of AI tools to create user guides that are um, cohesive through the community. So if you want a user guide for your information, just send me an outline. Will do, thank you. All right, any other? Can you share some examples of what you've produced? Love to see that. We're still working on it. We will show you when we do our presentation at the end of the summer. Okay. Sounds awesome. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, that's the teaser. <laughs> you got me. All right. Any other announcements? No. Okay. So for quarterly reports, uh, we do have the areas report that is out there. I did see a few um, approvals coming in. We probably have enough approvals, uh, though I did see one minor comment or clarification that needed to be done before we can merge that particular report. Uh, the Bevel report did come in sometime while I was asleep. Um, so I did see a number of people who've already reviewed that, but uh, that one was due today. Um, so. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look, please do so. Uh, then we've got the Solang report that's due next week. Uh, the Transact report is also due next week, but I know they're in dormant state. So Arun, if you wouldn't mind just reaching out to Transact and finding out, do they want to remain in dormant state or are they ready to move to 
an end of life state or, or what the status of that project is and whether or not we should expect to see a report from them. That would be great. All right. Uh, any questions on the reports? Okay, uh, so for discussion today, I did have uh, the security policy for us to vote on, although I did see a comment from Stephen come in. Uh, so I think we need to talk about that particular comment before we can think about a vote. Stephen, did you want to talk about your comment? So I, uh, before you do, I actually replied. Yeah, so. uh, there's, there's two comments. Um, okay. I definitely think the uh, how this is done automatic automatically should be included in there because I didn't get that from that and envisioned all this extra pipeline stuff that might be needed. So uh, would love to get um, a, a brief summary put into that of how that works or or just to say this is automatically done by GitHub. <laughs> um, the bigger comment, was one I've stated before on other things, and I'm happy to uh, ignore it, but um, I really find it difficult when we combine both the policy and the template into a single document. And so I think it would be much better to either have a separate document that is the template, or at least a delineating point in the single document that says from here on out, you know, use from from below this forward to see the um um to use as the template for a given project or repository um yeah i i just find that document is way too complex and difficult to maintain for a project because it has so many things to do with hyperledger policy and not to do with project policy all right. Thanks, Stephen. Hart. Hey, yeah. So one of the reasons why we did this, in, in fact, maybe the primary reason is so that people <laughs> could go to a single document uh, for a particular project and, and find out about all of the security policies. Um, you know, we have lots of people that come in to you know or report bugs to hyperledger that are, are really not familiar with the whole ecosystem and you know say if you're reporting a bug to base and you're coming from the ethereum uh ecosystem right you're not going to want to click through all of the different hyperledger stuff um you know you just want to know what do i need to know for reporting a bug to base um, so that's why we you know put this all in the same document um, I'm not exactly sure what you why you think this is going to be a, a big burden on maintainers. Um, can can you explain that to me? Yeah, Steve? yeah, because I, I think understand. because I think the security policy has enough flexibility in it that it's going to be different per project, and I think over time that the security policy will evolve at Hyperledger, and what developers will do is they'll just have a security document that was created at, at such a time and never changed. And, and that's what I think is the danger of it. That's what I see in the maintainers documents today is that, you know, at some point somebody created a maintainers document. It was the picture of what was there back in that day and never gets evolved. And, and it's important that these change over time. So that's, that's the maintenance thing that I have. And then the second is just when I practically go in and it was more of the maintainers, but when I practically went in and said, oh, I'm going to create this for Akapai, um, it was really painful to, to sort out what do I leave in because it's relevant and what do I remove because it's just verbiage that doesn't matter and is not relevant to, to Akapai. So that's the challenge I, I think. Again, I this is not I'm not going to not a not a hill to die on. So I'm fine if we want to keep going. It's just I, I find as a maintainer, this approach is kind of painful. All right, Dave. 
Yeah, I do tend to agree with Stephen. Uh, I think it can be resolved fairly easily by just putting the template information up top and then down below have more of a context or background uh, discussion there and say, if you're, if you're using the template, you can just ignore the stuff below or for reference, it's down below, but the policy is at the top. So I'm not entirely clear how you all think we can sort of separate the the template from the policy, um, you know, particularly in a way that uh, people coming from the outside or people who aren't as familiar with security can sort of read and, and understand, um, you know, is is one of you willing to take a crack at this? I'll take a shot at it. And, and what I'll do is take that document and produce an Akapai security, what I think should be in that. And then that to me would be a sample of a template. And so I, I can take that. Is that reasonable? And then And then we can see if we agree on that as a template. And again, you know, if it doesn't work, that's fine. I'll have wasted a bit of time, but um, that way you see what I'm thinking of. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see what you're thinking, and we can also take it to the open SSF if you want as well. No, I definitely want to do that. You do or don't? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I mean, I think that's the proper thing to do. I mean, that's what we did with this, what we have, right? We, we, Got it reviewed by the open SSF. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would have expected the open SFS to say, here's what you do. Um, every round. But yeah. anyway, I'm fine. I mean, if you don't think it's worth it, Hart, I, I'm fine. <laughs> As I say, I'm not going to. I just find it a little painful, but you no, know, I'm just curious. I don't understand like it. I, we tried to put it together in as, as non painful of a way as possible. So I just, I'm just trying to figure out the pain points. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the big thing you mentioned was, was big updates, but you know, I don't know that we are going to really see big updates. Um, and most of the updates are going to come from the projects themselves, you know, right. When they change something, when they change, you know, uh, change a, a reporting method or, or something like that. Okay. Um, um, then I guess, yeah, let's just go forward then. I mean, I, I look, if, if you think there are pain points, you know, like. No, I mean, that is the pain point is that if we think the whole document should go in every repository, tweet where the highlights are. Um. I, I disagree, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm happy to do it. It's a whole lot less work for me. All I do is copy and paste the document and make a few tweaks to it. I, I just think it's hard to, certainly hard to maintain. And yeah, but, but you're explicitly saying that you think because of the way people come into the projects, it's actually better to do it this way. So I'll, I'll go with that. Arun. Crazy. Um, I wanted to share the screen, but that's okay. I'll first probably just talk about one aspect. I think uh, Stephen, I see uh, what you were trying to um, uh, suggest. It's it's more from a developer or maintainer standpoint. Um, I, previously we were having discussions about having a, a link uh, from repositories to the one of the main repository to point a document point the current document to other document, right? Um, that's one available option. I don't know what the TOC here thinks. Um, for the security MD across all the repositories, if we can point them to one place uh, per project and then we maintain that infrastructure for the project over there. And in terms of what can change from a template versus um, the, the policy standpoint, 
I feel it's okay to have, uh, again, it's my opinion, it's feel okay to have the uh, verbose information saying this is what it means and uh, this is what the policy suggests. And we follow uh, this particular uh, uh, mechanism and delete the things that we probably don't want to keep in our project. And and mostly, most likely, uh, the places like this is going to change. Everything else will um, have the same verbosity. Um, in case of changing uh, uh, major changes to this policy document, which most likely we will not see in near future, um, again, the, the change effort would then be limited to one repository versus multiple repositories. That's, that's all. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I have a couple of comments based on the discussion so far. Uh, my first is that if maintainers think that this is confusing or difficult to complete, then we probably haven't done a good job of uh, documenting this, right? Um, and, and we should take into consideration things that are going to make it easier for people to do this rather than harder for people to do this. And then I guess my second comment is more of a question um, to people who might be reporting security bugs. If they are reporting security bugs to multiple projects and they come in and they're looking at a document that looks exactly the same at the beginning for project X versus project Y, will they not assume that because they've understood project X's security policy that they understand project Y's security policy without actually reading project Y's security policy? So those are, are my two kind of comments slash questions, concerns with where we're at right now based on the conversation we've had. Tracy, your last point is kind of what I was thinking when I mentioned I agreed with Stephen. So I think for people coming in and trying to figure out how to report a security bug, it should be pretty um, short and sweet and they shouldn't have to read all this verbose text to be able to figure out how to do that. That's why I was saying it would be good to have just some very clear guidance at the beginning saying, if you need to report a security vulnerability, use this email or, you, or use GitHub security advisories rather than having that kind of buried in the middle of the document. And then for a lengthier discussion, reference this document or reference the, the bottom um, for more details about our overall process and how we do things internally. All right, thanks Dave. Art? So I will say that the open SSF actually encouraged us to be more verbose and sort of explain everything for the reporters and, and how, you know, how things worked. Um, so, you know, um, I know that, you know, like people like Dave are obviously super familiar with all of these processes and, and security stuff. Um, uh, but, but I gather not everyone is. And, uh, when we did go over this with the open SSF, we were encouraged to be verbose. I think a verbose version does make a lot of sense. I just think a summary, um, would be, make a lot of sense at the top saying, if you just want to report a security vulnerability, here's how, here's where you go to do that. And then down below is, or a different document has the more verbose version. Okay, yeah, no, I think a, a summary makes sense. If we say, hey, if you know what you're doing, you know, just do this. Uh, otherwise, here's the full details. Sure, that makes sense to me. All right, Stephen? Uh, one thing I definitely think we should um, provide in this um, and realize, I, I really think this is important is that projects have many repositories. And so there definitely should be a thing that says this project uh, in, in every repository, there should be the option of having a, a pointer to the one true um, security document for the project. 
In other words, we don't want to repeat the same text in every repository because that that does become a a, a maintenance challenge when you even even just to change the name of a, a of a um, member of the security team, you've got to update all of the versions of the document. So there definitely should be an option to say in a given repository, point to the security uh, file for the rest of the project. Does that make sense? Yeah, we had absolutely intended it that way. I don't think that's in there. Um, so it should be um, stated. I didn't see it in there when I read through it. Yeah, I think it's not explicitly in there, but we did say it was the um, the policy was defined for the project, right? Not the repo. Oh, yeah. We can be more explicit about that, though. I think that's okay, so at the very top where it says copy this file and edit the highlighted. Uh, it should probably be right in there to say for a given repository, you may point to security document for the overall project. Sure. Yeah. All right. Arun, you had your hand up. Did it get answered? Oh, yeah. Um, right. I just wanted to uh, take opinion of adding this line at the top under the about this document section, where we say uh, after the first paragraph, which we see over here, uh, the next paragraph would be, if you're familiar with the security policies of this project and you're interested in reporting the bug, please uh, jump to this section. And that would be the summary uh, that we were discussing. I was about to ask if that's sufficient. Um, that would be in the, in the uh, maybe I can share the screen. Something like this, would it make sense? If you're familiar with the, uh, that would appear in the markdown like this. And then uh, we can add the instructions for maintainers at the top, uh, saying that we don't necessarily need to copy this file in all the repositories. We can also have a link to one central report, um, link to one document which your project considers as the, um, I don't know, should we call it a main repository or primary repository? My position would be if you are, as a project, using the boilerplate uh, security recommendations here, um, it I think it would be okay to just link to the governance repo where this will, or the talk repo, wherever this lives. I think that would be okay. Say so we use the Hyperledger security policy and here's a link. Um, that's not a very strongly held opinion. Uh, Hart? So, Raya, I don't think that works because we have a lot of personal stuff that needs to be listed on here, like who's on the security team. Um, you know, so so I don't think, you know, the, the idea was that we didn't have to have like a, a central repo for like every single person on the security team, right? And we had let, let the projects pick that. Um, so there's enough information in here that's cataloged that, you know, we would have to take a totally different strategy if we wanted to allow that. Okay. So something like all of the ARIES repos, could they do that and point to the ARIES policy, which is in one repo? Yes. Okay. That's what we're is good. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Um... Yes, I know. Yeah, I apologize for background noise. I'm in an airport, but uh, I, 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 I have to say I'm leaning towards uh, Stephen's opinion. I, I think there may be a way to kind of split like the general stuff that's applicable across the board with uh, across the hyperledger, and and then you know have a smaller version, which has more of the specific stuff with the pointer to the general stuff. And it's kind of a middle ground where we, we still have distributed information for each piece that's specific to the project. So it stays close to the project, but for the main 
crux of the policy, which is applicable across the board, this can be centralized. All right, thanks, Arno. Dave? Uh, I did, did have another comment uh, above the one that we've just been talking about that has still not been addressed. It's the discussion about whether to use the security email versus use GitHub security reporting. Um, first of all, I think it needs to be more clear in the document that there are two options. And then secondly, the instructions as they are here lean heavily towards the email approach. Well, at least for the Fabric project itself, I pr prefer the GitHub approach. And so I think we should, maybe we need a broader discussion about, do we want to raise the status of GitHub reporting a little bit more than it is here? Uh, or just maybe we make just make it more obvious for projects to make that decision. Um, but for, at least for Fabric, the reason I like to use the secure reporting is because it's everything would be in one place in GitHub. There's a process from start to finish from reporting through disclosure. That's all in one place. Uh, and then secondly, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense if we have like say a dozen projects and three people on each project that are on the security team. There's 36 people. And if somebody's reporting an issue to Fabric, why do we need to send that out to 36 people? 33 of who probably don't care much about that issue. So that's kind of my bigger reason of why I wanted to push a little bit higher uh, or push the GitHub reporting process a little bit more rather than the email. But at the end of the day, I agree. It's up to the, each project to make that decision. All right, thanks Dave. Hart? Yeah, so the email has mostly been there for historic reasons. Um, that was, you know, sort of a, a required reporting channel in the past. Um, you know, if if people don't like that, you know, we can change it, um, you know, that, that's just been the, the understanding in the past. Um, so yeah, Dave, I mean, you, you're obviously welcome to, you know, um, for, for Fabric explicitly say that the GitHub is the, the preferred policy. All right, thanks Hart, Peter. For me, the email list gives me a little more sense of security in the sense that if somehow everyone from Cacti who should be seeing the vulnerabilities come in misses them, then maybe the email list is a good last resort fallback in the sense that if there's some critical vulnerability that we're not seeing maybe someone else on the mailing list will see it and let us know. Thanks, Peter. Hart? Yeah, I will say, you know, this has not applied to a project like Fabric that is very on top of typically of responding to security bugs. Uh, but one of the advantages of the security list is it has enabled uh, staff to see who's behind on security bug issues. All right, thanks, Hart. It, I, I will point out um, one of the more complex projects that we have for this is Bezu. Bezu has their own security mailing list. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, they agitated for that uh, was that they, I'm sorry, advocated for that, was uh, that they wanted everyone on the list to see the inbound emails, um, even though they use the private GitHub, uh, you know, reporting methodology. Uh, we could, you know, have a, uh, you know, a per project security email setup, I would really rather not do that because it becomes more, even more complex. Um, but that, you know, that is one thing that the Bezu project wanted was they wanted a per project visibility onto these emails and who is and isn't uh, paying attention. So.
All right, let me try. Any other comments that we missed in this that we need to make sure we cover here? So just to close the loop on that one, I can update the document with uh, what I was talking about, saying it's up to the project. And there's these two options that a lot of projects use, but of course, projects can use yet a different approach too. All right, thanks, Dave. That'd be great. Um, just your pull request there. And, and Stephen, I think people were uh, in agreement with your request, your original thought of somehow separating. Um, so if you wanted to also do the example that you suggested with Akapai, I think that would be good uh, to close on this particular issue. I thought I had avoided that. I, I conceded to heart. I, I, got, I avoided work. Yeah, but then everybody else was like, no, Stephen, you can't avoid work. Um, because we all agree with you, Stephen. Fine. <laughs> all right. Um, any other any other comments on the, the security policy then? We won't do it with the vote today. We'll wait until we're um, in a different spot, I guess. All right, if there's no uh, further comments there, the next task force that we thought we'd start up um, was the Security Artifact Signing Task Force. Um, so this task force was um, considered some, some low hanging fruit uh, to help improve the security using uh, six store for artifact signing. Uh, and so obviously developing some best practices and tooling for Hyperledger to go ahead and use SIGSTORE for the artifact signing um, is, is really what this task force is all about um, or what it was intended to be when we initially uh, put it here in the issue. Uh, we didn't have a leader step up yet for this, uh, but we did have some people who suggested that they would be interested in participating in this. So I think the, the question that I have for today is twofold. Um, first, do we have a volunteer to lead this particular task force? And then secondly, uh, to just uh, double check on the, the list of deliverables and the task and, and make sure that that's exactly what we want to do. Arun? Yeah, um, I'm in. I can get started on this. And actually, I wanted to talk a few more points to, for us, all of us to get started on this particular task force. Okay, great. So Arun, you'll be the leader and uh, maybe I'll let you take over the conversation then. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I think most of um, uh, the people on this call are familiar, at least I know Arnaud is completely involved um, in much more deeper level with the OpenSSF community. And um, Art is definitely aware of these um, um, options available through OpenSSF. And we can all agree uh, that um, 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 when we do a release, uh, it has to be, so um, for the security policy document that we all read, it also suggests in a way that um, security is not just to be looked into uh, from coding standpoint, but also it, it's the complete holistic view adopts uh, uh, every aspect of it, including the uh, infrastructure which we use for releasing artifacts. Now, uh, there are multiple questions that come to us when we talk about releasing artifacts. And uh, we'll have to uh, address that somewhere in the policy document. And I haven't seen a specific document as such for releases yet. And the only place where I come up, came across about the releases is that each project is free to choose their own uh, release. Uh, process. The release taxonomy, however, is uh, suggested uh, through the policy. Now, uh, continuing that, there is some uh, policy that we'll have to uh, note over there on process to be followed for releases, at least from a security standpoint. That's one uh, open item that we can all get started on. And then um, specifically talking about 
signing any artifacts that originates of as part of the release. OpenSSF has this tool um, which uh, which has been um, made available in uh, GA. That's called Six Store. It has multiple components for us, and at least the tool that is of importance is uh, the one that uh, that we can all leverage for signing the artifact. The advantage and what differentiates this from rest of the uh, tools available over there is in terms of key management. I think that's, I would call a, 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 a best approach in, in terms of not having to maintain or store the key uh, for a longer duration of time. In fact, it generates on demand and we sign the release and then the key is ephemeral. It's It's not needed to be there for a long time. I know OpenSSF also has a infrastructure for us to leverage, where all the sign um, logs are maintained in in a uh, open log, transparent, immutable open log, as they call it, which the users of software can verify. Now, that's from a signing standpoint uh, that we can all say, hey, here is a tool that we should all leverage in terms of uh, releasing softwares. And now from a policy standpoint, I know it sounds easy, but from a maintainer standpoint, that may require them to work on their uh, the deployment pipelines that, that already is there. And um, now the bigger question, however, is also in terms of usage of uh, those artifacts that are produced. Now, um, the, the SIG store definitely does have a support, which at least on the Kubernetes deployment side, if we are doing a container uh, releases, mm -hmm. then they do have an option which can be added as an admission uh, controller check plugin, which allows uh, Kubernetes to natively do verify if it is pulling in um, images that are produced from Hyperledger Foundation has been uh, signed and uh, is following the, pr uh, the process that is expected. Now, we'll have to further explore that option. I was trying to look into what happens for the SDK releases that we do from the projects, right? And then um, when we talk about developer-focused things, the majority of the time, um, the developers, they they will um, make use of SDKs that are uh, released. And uh, artifacts are generally pulled in uh, through some of the... Uh, tools like Maven or, or Gradle for Java and then similarly for other projects, right? So language, it could be uh, through the, um, uh, like, uh, I forgot what it is for Go, but for Rust, I think there is like the crates that are pulled in, uh, they get pulled in through the Rust, uh, uh, um, I mean, through the Rust, I keep forgetting things, my bad, sorry. Yeah, so, so I think you, yeah, cargo, my mind. So I think you get an idea uh, that I tried to search for those options from six stores. If we do say um, like we should start following six stores, it is good from a, it is good first step from a maintainer standpoint, but from a usage perspective, there are still open questions um, that we'll have to write down or at least say like these are the opens. And if you are using these artifacts and if you would like to verify, then do follow these processes or do follow up with uh, OpenSSF, right? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring these topics up before we go deep uh, dive discussing all these questions further. And one more thing we'll have to look into is in terms of adding S-bombs and uh, specifically when we talk about releases, the artifact releases, I'm not sure if we have done that uh, or defined the process for doing that so far. That's it. I'll probably take a pause and open up for discussion. Peter? I only have a deep dive comment. So sorry if I'm derailing the conversation. We can table this for the next meeting too. 
but uh, the first thing, the first idea I had is to look at SIG store and then find out how could I quickly integrate that to Cacti releases today. And I found quickly that there's a GitHub action for it. So then my question is, can we have this installed in, or is it already installed in the Hyperledger GitHub org? And if yes, can I can just give it a spin? As in, do we need any anything else for it? Or can I just try and install it and then see how it works? Um, it's not, I mean, this is a per repo thing. So you should feel free to install that uh, GitHub action. If it needs further permissions, then please just reach out directly. Okay. You know, I'm I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at it. It doesn't seem that it needs any additional like super permissions or anything. But uh, I, I assume you're talking about cosine installer. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. Uh, just go ahead and uh, give it a whirl, and uh, let's see how it goes. Thank you, Ray. I have one more question, just because I see no one else has raised their hand. Uh, unrelated but important question is uh, if anyone knows if they have a list of supported artifacts to sign because it looks like it's somehow generic and just works with everything because at the end of the day we are just signing files that are just big blobs of data but is there some sort of additional convenience feature that makes it easier to work with uh, NPM dependencies, for example? Or is it really just this low level piece of uh, infrastructure where it the only assumption it makes is that the input is a giant file with release artifacts? All right. Right. Um... I don't know an open source reference. I'm sorry about that, but I do know um, the process that one of the organizations that I worked with in the past followed in, in releasing uh, the softwares. And that was uh, purely, there, there were no like set tools as such. However, the uh, software installer package did have an option to go and uh, verify uh, the signatures, right? So uh, it was built in as part of the installer packages. Then uh, the, the signing process was the usual thing. Like there was no set tool to do it. Uh, we could always, we, we could as well just leverage um, any tool that, that we are familiar with, including for instance, OpenSSL if we were to choose one. Uh, but those were like proprietary software sold uh, as packages. I don't have a reference for how this happens in open source, and uh, except the six store, I, I don't know how six store works now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on the deep end immediately. I know we are just trying to figure out how to kick up the task force. I was. I just got curious. If I may interject here, I mean, yes, uh, six store is designed so that you can pretty much sign any kind of blob of data. It yeah. doesn't really matter what yeah, it is. Like you can do whatever you want from that point of view. I mean, the whole idea is, you know, we used to have uh, sign packages where you put a hash and a signature along. The problem is, you know, it's very hard to find the keys and then the maintainers lose their keys and so on. And so six store addresses this problem by providing a central point where you can find the information for you to verify the signature. That's all. All right, thanks Arno. Part you had your hand up, is there something you want to add? I was just gonna, you know, uh, say to Peter that, yeah, it's great to explore this stuff. Um, uh, you know, Go ahead and, and, and give it a shot. The deep dive is great. So I, I just want to applaud Peter's enthusiasm.
Yeah, I think the the best way we could probably succeed in this particular task force is for people to try this out and see how it works. And, um, you know, from there we can develop those best practices and, and really document for others how to use the tools. I will point out that I have a number of test uh, GitHub orgs where we can do stuff like this in a painless way. So feel free to reach out and let's uh, get this set up. All right, thanks, right here. Right, you still have that hyperledger dash CICD org? Probably. That's what I was thinking of. I just don't know if I've deleted it or not. Okay. If if I can, if it still exists and I can still have access, then I wouldn't mind playing around with the cacti clone over there. Yeah, let's. It looks like I deleted that org, so uh, let's follow up. Okay. All right. All right. Right. Um. Just wanted to ask. So, are we all aligned on using six store and adopting that? in our release process. Looks like that's the direction we are trying to take. Peter? I definitely support it on a first glance because it appears to be uh, well adopted based on the series of logos that I'm Look, I'm seeing on their website and with a tool like this, in my opinion, one of the most important things is adoption and also uh, how it's being maintained. So even if even if we found another competing solution solving the same problem 10% better, which is always subjective, but let's assume that it is somehow 10% better, but no one is using it then I would still say, let's just use six store because it has community adoption. All right, any other thoughts at the moment? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I think next week's uh, task force discussion is the automated pipelines. Um, so Peter, I think you're up for next week for the task force. And hopefully we can come back and uh, see about the changes and updates made to uh, the security policy. So for vulnerability disclosures, um, so that we can close out on that particular item as well. Uh, Rama? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jyoti. I uh, just want to let people know uh, the meeting scheduled for the badging and lifecycle task force tomorrow, same time as this call. So uh, I know some of you express interest in joining, but anybody who wants can join. Uh, at least I'll expect that, I guess, you, Tracy, Arun, Peter, and Bobby should will be on. So And... I'll leave some notes on the uh, Discord before the call. Sorry, I didn't get time only this week, but I'll do so before the call. All right. Thanks, Rama, for, for reminding us all of that call um, so that we can join that one and uh, make some forward progress there. Any other last items, comments? No. Okay. Well, then I will go ahead and close off this meeting. Safe travels to Arno. Uh, and we will see you all again next week.